at a major Hollywood studio. In a corner office of Sub-Basement D. The development executives toil in obscurity to reboot it. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Reboot It Season 3, the series for the golden age of Hollywood IP where all of your favorite franchises will get reboots. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when. And we are here to try to do it better than anybody else in town. Today's episode is going to be a little bit weird. We are going to uh, mash up, well, we're going to follow in the tradition of something that's been going on with modern reboots from a very specific studio. But before we even get into it, let's talk about the reboot crew, my partners in crime, as usual, you know them, you love them, starting with Billy Business. If today's episode is great, it was all my idea. If it's terrible, it was all Ed's idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that brings us to the second member of the reboot crew, Ed Greer. Yeah, I'll, I'll cop to that. I'll be second in command of if this turns into a damn Hindenburg, because I wanted to take this behind a building and shoot it a long time ago, and it kept escaping my grasp, and now we're here. We, <laughs> so we, we shall see. Billy has not let us escape the gravitational pull of Pixar, and somehow <laughs> we ended up with the worst franchise in the Pixar canon. But again, before we get into it, last member of the Reboot crew, you know him, you love him, Ron Swallow. Hey! Oh, you guys, this is going to be fun. We're going to have a good time with this. It's going to go great. I think I just <laughs> jinxed us. I think I just jinxed us. I want to get out right away. Who here knows anything about cars? Because I know the bare minimum. Oh, Ron. Wait, 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 wait. Cars as in like actual motor vehicles or the <laughs> film series? Of the cars. films. Okay. The film okay, okay. Here's, yeah, here's, here's I, yeah, the yeah, thing, yeah. guys. Both. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. This I know about the I, centric episode. I fix cars because I was forced to fix cars. That's what you do when you're poor and you have to <laughs> fix your car because you can't pay someone else to do it. You just figure out how to do it. Um, and then also... I really enjoyed uh, the cartoon. Plus, it's probably one of the best rides uh, at California Adventure. 100%. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, so were any of you guys um, the little kid who was super into like cars and planes and trucks and stuff? Because even going back that far, I was not. I have been hard pass on any motor vehicle based toys, have no interest in it whatsoever. Well, my, my dad was, uh, uh, I, I wish it was God rest his soul, but sadly he's still alive. Um, I love this episode already, guys. This is the best idea I've ever had, (laughs) but he, he did build hot rods. Uh, and so as a youngster, when I, uh, thought my dad was the best, uh, I loved the cars. So he had like a, 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 a 64 Impala was the first one he had. Then he had a 66 Chevy Nova, a uh, Super Sport 350 V8 with the Edelbrock, you know, all the fancy. It had 480 horsepower. He had a, the wheels used to pop off the ground when he took off, you know, like all the cool stuff you see in Fast and the Furious. was just my dad, but he was also, you know, drunk while doing that. So what I'm saying, guys is cars this movie we're gonna make right now is all about drunk dads no seriously uh i always thought cars were fun uh you know it's just like it's funny too because like i didn't get my first car for a while but like i always thought it was interesting like how do they run what do they how do they do the stuff they do and uh you know you look cool i mean cars are cool i guess are they (laughs) This I do the central <laughs> conflict of the episode, by the way. I do think that there's, um, well, I won't say universally, but I do think that there is like this, I don't even know if it's just American, but there is kind of like this fascination, you know, with cars and car culture. I mm. definitely think that it's something that as Americans, especially, we all kind of are like, you you want to get the best car, the fancy car, the sexy car, the car defines your status in life. The car, you know, can be a hobby or it can be, you know, like, oh, I know everything about that person because of the car that they drive. What's weird 
about cars, the movies was that the car culture was infused within the characters themselves. So that what should have been kind of like an interesting uh, story, it leaves you with more questions of like, well, wait, why is there a whole functioning society with no people? You know, like what happened? Why are these cars sentient? Why is there like there's definitely uh, like rest areas and places like in hotels and stuff, but they're for people, not cars. So something happened to them. They just raised more questions than it did. Like I, it was almost distracting to the point where you're just like the story that they were trying to tell was kind of lost because you're like, this is a really weird choice. It's a weird, weird world. There are definitely uh, internet fan theories out there that place the Cars franchise in the same timeline as like the Matrix or the Terminator. Um, nice. Yeah. Because when you think about like, especially classic Disney or, or kids movies where they're centered around an object that is sentient, like the Brave Little Toaster, it still has a human connection of trying to get back to its owner. Whereas this is just like, Oh, I, I don't know who's in the stands. It's other cars are in the stands. Like it's it's well, so bonkers. I can't wait to do this. It, it's, I'm, it's I'm a, so excited. It's like well, doing it's like mo- doing a movie about a brave toaster when there's no bread. What are you <laughs> doing? What's your job? There's no, there's Why no do you bread. exist? <laughs> well, no in this bread. look, guys, uh, you're making this a lot more complicated than it needs to. It's, I can't. It's it's not surprising with you guys by the way, that you're overthinking cars. Cars, all it is, is talking cars that represent people. That's literally all it is. And and sure, you there were some themes that you could have, they, they had, the guy was selfish and had to get better as a person and accept this small town uh, 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 community into his he life. You had to get so better as a car, be not a person, Ron. Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But uh, in this world, the car are the people. He had um, to change something. his car personality to be a better car. <laughs> Absolutely. Here's here's something actually pretty interesting. Uh, uh, cars actually started out as like an ugly duckling type story about an electric car because uh, the guy who came up with the idea at first was like, uh, he had he lived in, um, I want to, what was it, uh, Denmark? And they made an electric car that just kind of was ugly and looked like crap and nobody wanted to buy it. And it also was, wasn't was fast enough to go on highways and you know, it had its problems or whatever, but people just like hated it so much. They were so mad about this electric car that um, uh, the, the guy Jorgen wanted to make it sort of like, his first idea was like, it's an ugly ducking store, duckling story where this electric car gets, uh, you know, acceptance um, eventually and, you know, becomes part of everybody and everybody accepts him. But that obviously they were like the first part, they were like, ah, I don't know about that. Yeah, that but is like the, not the story of cars. Not at all. <laughs> it's uh, it's gas guzzling race cars <laughs> competing in a thing. And a guy who's like a rich race car guy gets stuck in a small town from some accident and then, you know, Makes friends and with them, and that's, hey, that's perfect. I don't even need to yeah. do my rundown of the franchise. You got it right there, Boom. dude. He did, he did it. And also, it's just funny how it it does kind of juxtapose like what you would do with making a race car driver a race car is an oddly poetic, beautiful thing to do. It's like it's not just a relationship between a man and its car; it's a relationship between a man and himself, a car but and really, himself, Billy. It, if you look at if you look at the first movie and the third movie in the series, they're basically Rocky style formulas. Like you're turning it into an athlete story by making the driver into the vehicle. Um, just to expand a little bit on Ron's summary, which did a great job. Cars is the story of Lightning McQueen, who, when we meet him in the first movie, is an up and coming race car on the race car circuit, which. I suppose is similar to like the boxing circuit in as we understand it as human beings. Mm. Um, and then by the end, he's he's in danger of being phased out. Cars three really is a weird riff on like Rocky three and four, where he's going up against these younger, fitter, more high tech opponents. And he has to reconnect with old mentors in order to, you know, find the grit to be better than the newer, younger competitors. Um, and then <laughs> By far the most maligned Pixar film of all time, wedged in the middle of those two athlete stories, 
is a weird spy story that globe trots all over the world where Mater the tow truck voiced by Larry the Cable Guy becomes an international man of mystery. Um, <laughs> to this day, the only certified rotten, rotten tomatoes rating in all of the Pixar canon. So did a lot to tell this. This franchise is important because it did a lot to take the sheen off of Pixar. It put a real dent in the armor. And I think the last thing we want to talk about here, Disney, which, of course, is the parent company, Pixar, has really made it their mission over the past 10 years to adapt all of their animated properties into quasi live action versions. And when I say quasi live action, because we all saw Jungle Book and we all real and The Lion King, and we all realize that this really has nothing to do with live action and everything to do with just how they're CG animating everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the conversation today, unless we have a big disagreement is Let's turn Cars into one of these realistic Disney adaptations. Yeah, buddy. This is what I'm all about. You know why? Because you know it's coming, and I think we get ahead of it, and I think we take Cars, which is, by the way, I Rotten Tomatoes all aside, I think... I have no stat to back this up, but anecdotally, I think it's like one of the hottest selling merchandise things for oh, Pixar. Very much so. very because much. kids love cars. So oh, this, this, I think maybe second only to Toy Story, this was the most successful Pixar franchise. It made even it, financially it, at the box office. I yeah, mean, the first made one made $360 million. Like that's the profit. Mm -hmm. So that, it was successful. I think that counts as successful. I mean, they made three of them. You know, yeah. there's only only Toy Story has that many sequels, you know, so they, they definitely see it. That's why, like, I as much as we kind of laugh about this uh, and say this all in jest, like it is coming. They're not going to sit on cars for too long because it is profitable for them and you have to find a way to reinvent it. And once they they have been burning through their slate of animated movies to live action, like instead of pacing it out like one a year, they'll give you like three or four a year. So we are only a few years away from getting like Home on the Range, Brother Bear and Cars. It's coming. <laughs> Brother Bear. Oh. I hope so. I hope okay, so. Okay. okay, okay, okay. This is my thing. I, I think we cut to the quick of it. What type of movie are we trying to make? Because I want to strike out hard and fast against another Rocky story. I want to strike out hard and fast against a spy story uh, because of how horrifically that went. That was a, a car wreck, if you will. Uh, but I think the direction that I would that I would go in if I had my druthers and I like to just throw these out here as springboards fast and the furious. But the cars are the, the people and not like as. I don't care if it's as dumb as Fast and the Furious. I'm not going to get pious about this in this particular episode. But I do think there's something to the outlaw lifestyle of cars we've never seen. That's the one aspect of it we've never seen. There wasn't there wasn't a, a crime or the concept of crime or the concept of actual adventure with these things that can be smashed apart, that can go flying off cliffs and smash and die has never been explored except in the terms of racing or a spy movie where you know no one's going to die i just think we make a real live movie there's real live lions for a reason they're giving you a sense of menace they're, they were trying to give you a sense of the destructive capability of these things i'm saying i i think a plot that has adventure with the cars i like that better than anything well i okay i i like that that being said i think well, I think we twist the, the actual story. You know, it's it's a big town guy going to a small town and finding the joy of small town community. What if it's a, a, a rural redneck type of car going to the big city and learning that everybody in the city is in something crappy? OK, that's why I said Fast and the Furious, because Fast and the Furious is ethnic. Jesus Christ, I'm done with Larry the Day. Cable guy and Reba McIntyre being all the voices. I'm done. No, with I that. don't make me I, I don't watch a whole movie starring Larry the Cable Guy. No, it's not. It's not that. I I, I didn't mean to come across like I was supporting that. Uh, that I came across <laughs> that way says something bad about you guys. 
honestly, <laughs> because you I assumed just, immediately <laughs> that I would just be supporting Larry the Cable Guy. You guys think that's me? That's what you? No. no well, that's, just because that, I grew no. up in a trailer doesn't mean I actually like Larry the Cable Guy. I, got I don't know. I just assume guy. you had like like the Jesus candles of Larry the Cable Guy <laughs> on your mantle. Uh, I do. I do. Listen. You got you caught me. <laughs> uh, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to put some structure on this because this is about to go way off the rails. <laughs> Do we think we're making a movie for the same age range as the original Cars, which, let's be honest, is like three to six year olds? No, that's a good point. <laughs> or are we doing something else here? Like, what? Who? who is the audience that's coming into this movie? Because Ed is definitely pitching something for like teenagers. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, I think so. Yeah, I think I, 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 I think that follows in the trend of like when you look at aladdin uh which is one of their more successful live action reboots uh it's it is geared a little bit more like sophisticated than what its animated counterpart was that's not always the case sometimes it's like a literal shot for shot 1998 psycho remake but i think and in, in the ones that work the best are the ones that take the core of what that story was update it refresh it mature it a little bit and then trot it back out there so it's like it feels familiar but it also feels new enough that you don't feel like you're just watching you know the same thing all over again so are we telling a story about lightning mcqueen and more so than just the name are we telling a story about a hot shot cocky car who gets kind of brought down to earth by his encounter with some unfamiliar people. Is that the story? Oh, perhaps you guys Ed, have Ed read my that. No, uh, yes, I do. But perhaps you've, perhaps you've read my screenplay car wick where somebody kills a car's dog. No, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm just Good joking. God. <laughs> no, I, I, I am not pitching that at all. Uh, and definitely not anything violent. I don't, I don't, I want to make it very clear. I don't want violent, but action, Jack like cool Kirby, stunts. Jack Kirby made it very clear. He drew action, not violence. He drew fifties comic books that still had a lot of action, but they were not violent. You know what I mean? So I, I think it's not necessary to be violent. Well, which makes sense because cars, it's not like cars are going to punch and kick each other. Right. So, right, well, I mean, they could trade some paint. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. They could have, <laughs> look, we're talking about, we're talking about CG. They could have like a, a thing that pops out like the Green Hornet and uh, sh shoots a, instead of a missile, he shoots a, a fist. Where do fists come from? I don't know. But I guess my question then becomes like, <clears throat> do we take this? Uh, like I, I, I said it kind of tongue in cheek, but now I'm, I'm really asking like, do we try to tell the story of like, how this world of cars came to be like do we acknowledge the facts that human beings don't exist in this world maybe they did at one point and cars are all that's left and now they've kind of built themselves in the image of i mean we want to make some dark hellscape where uh climate change has killed all the people <laughs> i don't no, think you have to make it dark i'm just saying you know here's a, ahead, real, a real answer to that is i think you can have some sense some sense of like unexplained melancholy over the whole thing. It's almost like, no, there's, there wasn't an apocalypse, but maybe there was like a, and again, we never show this. We never explain this, but in our head canons, as we're writing this, there was literally like a biblical rapture in which all of the humans disappeared. And I was so going to say, what if the, you know, with Wally, -E, when they all kind of left the planet, it's like, what if they just left the planet and this was what was left behind was the cars, you know? And at this point, like if they're advanced cars, they could have AI in them. And, and again, I don't know that we even need to explain any of this, but I, what I'm getting okay. at is, can you tell a story about an entire civilization where everything in it feels purposeless? You know what I mean? Like, is that part of the, the DNA of this story is that all the like cars are made to carry people. Why do cars exist in a world without people? They have no reason to exist. And again, it's not, it's not that the story tackles a car being like, 
we need people to come back so I have a reason not to kill myself. <laughs> but it's more just no. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's I gotta, more just I gotta like, be honest with you, Bill. I yeah. thought the shit I said was dark. No, that is the most dark crap. I have but, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just I, cars sad with no purpose. But I think that's driving that, around honestly, empty, as, looking as, at their inside. As dumb as it sounds, as dumb as it sounds, that's kind of the crux of what Toy Story ends up being about is like the per like finding purpose and i actually like the idea that maybe they took to racing because racing seems to be such a big part of cars because it's like well what do we do now that everyone's left i like the idea that like i don't think we should have the cars like the the fenders and stuff move as the mounts but i do like the idea of like apple carplay in your car where it's like the dashboard almost like night rider where they're speaking uh, through rider. their ai uh, but I do like the idea of like, okay, they've left. Um, we're still here. What what do we do? And I like the idea of, you know, the first car kind of is about finding uh, purpose, especially the third one. And I like mm -hmm. the idea of using that as like, okay, if you were built by, he by your creator and then abandoned by your creator, how do you find your sense of self? And I think like, as silly as that sounds, like that's actually a very in line with like a Pixar type of, of mindset for a movie. Oh, I want to reiterate, uh, not iter reiterate, I want to say that I, didn't, I don't think it's stupid. I think it's great. I just also think it's super dark. I mean, well, again, it's, it's a matter kinda? of what you, it's a matter of what you make important to the story and what you don't. I mean, yeah. the way that mm. I'm picturing this is like, Nobody ever actually utters the word human. You never see any vestige of a human. It's more just that there is suffused into the writing. There's this idea of like, okay, yeah, to Billy's point, maybe it's we've created this entire culture around racing. Why do we do that? Well, because it's what we were made to. It's like what we're meant to do. It's what we do well. Can we do other things? I don't know. You know what I mean? There's almost like a naivety to it. Stunts. You can do stunts. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's that's part of what I the only part that I that I am looking at as like, I don't want us to be too slavish to the original in regards to just racing and stuff, because I just think like I, like I was trying to say before in a tongue in cheek way, there's so many adventures that cars can go on. And I think that's the heart of what I would say if I were to come up with a pitch for it uh, to go with this idea, something about. If we're not so hung up on the fact that it's people missing. The thing that I might think that is missing is agency, because if you're a bunch of machines, even if you're a bunch of naturally evolved machines, like the first, you know, single celled robot thing crawled out of the oceans a long time ago, and then they have evolved naturally from their silicon form to more metals or whatever. Over the course of this time, they become cars. They become what we would see as cars in this weird vast multiverse. It ain't necessarily our Earth. I'm just saying the type of stuff that cars would think of themselves to do running on grids, doing something very regimented. And then a couple cars or a car comes along. And he's like, hey, I don't just want to go around in circles. I'd like to drive that way until I fall off the edge of the earth. And everybody's like, no, car, you must participate in our stupid ass thing that we've done forever. I just like I want something of that element to be in the story, not just that what I just said, but just something about a rebellious uh, uh, the car the car is trying to do something that's against society or something the car is trying to graduate to society or do something other than other than postulating a weird rick and morty world in which cars <laughs> naturally evolved from a single celled <laughs> organism we're saying the same thing yeah. it's just the backstory that's differing well yeah okay, i just cool. i just don't want it to all center around things going racing. in circles yeah i just well, also think, it doesn't have to be circle yeah. racing there could be drifting they could be yeah, going all that around stuff. different But that's corners. that's the I think that's the whole point is that like they want to get away from the racing because they want to be they they feel like they're capable of more okay. even though that's not what they were built for, you know. I think ooh, it, I, I think ooh. it's simple, right? It's it's mm. it's they race because everybody just accepts this is what we were made to do and it is very regiment. It is very mm -hmm. driving in circles. It's 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 a clockwork society because they're okay. machines. Yeah. And then the protagonist becomes somebody who is exactly doing what you say, Ed. I just want to drive down this road until it ends. And everybody around him is like, "Why would you drive until the road ends? That accomplishes nothing." And it's like 
but racing in circles accomplishes nothing. And they're like, oh my God, <laughs> blasphemy. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> yeah. And he's yeah. like, he's like, I'm just trying to accomplish something in nothing in a different direction. And just, 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 just a, a society that, was going in circles so much that they never realized that there was whole other societies over other places. Well, okay, that's a whole other. Now you're now you're some. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What does what does that mean? No, no, I'm saying like for car, for for uh, cars with a Z two and three three. Uh, that I'm just saying that would be a place that you can naturally go if we have a society that is circular, literally circular. That and then nobody ever just drives to the end of the road. How do you know what's down there? How do you know what what adventures await? way across the horizon you don't know if those cars are like big smashing machines and they're not just cars you guys over here are cars these guys over in australia might be smashing machines these guys over here might be you know boats i don't know I, you know what i'm saying if i can yes and that to really bring this conversation full circle there would be an amazing scene where having traveled where no one else has traveled one of the cars ends up at a spacecraft craft launch pad but none of those vehicles are there because they yes. already took off. You know what I mean? And it yes. almost becomes like discovering dinosaur bones. Like, uh -huh. what is this place? What is this? That's what I'm getting at. Thank you. Yes. That's yes. yes. And good job. Yes. And then you tie it's it's your it's your tie to whenever they make Wally -E and everyone left on the spaceship. <laughs> right. It, I think it's it, a big it gold just cup on the ground. To, yeah, it does just enough to hint at the backstory without us having to explain the humans all up and left. It's more and, just like the cars end up at the launch site and they're like, I have no idea what this is. But that's know. also cool because then you realize like, oh, this isn't like a strange parallel universe. This is the future, you know, like that's Planet that's, of the Apes situation. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think that's awesome. But at the same time, <laughs> it's a metaphor for like, I mean, really, if you think about it, it's a metaphor for life. I mean, you could keep going in the same circles that you're living in and doing your, you know, your being in and never learn and never get better and never find out what's out of your little thing mm. or you could go down this road and learn about the spaceship that might have existed at some point i think that's actually like kind of deep dude and, and also and just imagine still make them. it silly and funny but i also dude. think that that's like kind of cool yeah oh, and and uh, real feel I, I want I want to I want in the in the R rated Snyder cut. I want to have the scene where they come across a junkyard for the first time. And they're just like, oh, my no, God. No. Oh, my God. Somebody's <laughs> somebody's throwing up oil. No, I don't know. <laughs> no, but, you know, just just to see a bunch of stacked up dead cars because they were so far outside of society that no one was there to help them. I think that's, I think that's them. within bounds. I still think like there's a little bit of like the, it feels a almost like the, the elephant graveyard of Lion King. You Ooh, know? Totally. I think so too. So is there a, is there an antagonist in this movie? Can we start to think about like, who are we pitting our brave little toaster of a car against? Whoever I definitely think races. I definitely think, yeah, there's, there's, I, I think you're mm. right. It's, it's definitely someone that's, we can't break the status quo because if you leave and everyone else leaves and I run these races, then I lose my purpose. And I think the antagonist is trying to keep this car from basically starting a car volution of <laughs> other cars. <laughs> it's this uh -huh. weird universe where humans have left. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. somehow the best and dumbest thing we've ever done. I don't it's, think it's that dumb. It's I don't so think great. it's that dumb. I, no, I honestly it's, think it it's already all. better than the first Cars movie. I actually agree. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's also hilarious because the concept is just so ridiculous. This is so it's fun. I, like, I tried okay, to so, tell you. I tried to I, tell now, you. Now I'm, now I'm just picturing scenes out of my head. It's almost like once he gets go, once a Lightning McQueen, for lack of a better way to put yeah, our yeah. hero, yeah. gets going that. down the road, he encounters snow for the first time. And then he comes across a little small town where like the cranes and the plows and everything else are just going about their business to keep all the roads clear, but they don't really know why. And he's the one mm. to ask why, like, why are you, why do you just keep doing this every day, plowing the roads, refilling the salt, dumping the salt? And they, they don't really know. And he starts recruiting people along with him in a way that feels dangerous to whoever this power, power head of the society is, right? Like and that's how you, all their roles. I think that's how you reimagine with a different actor, Mater, where it's like uh, his purpose is to 
tow cars, but to where, you know, <laughs> like he's always on the side of the road waiting, but there no cars come out that way. So he's, I almost feel like you treat the scene of his introduction, like the Tin Man in the Wizard of Oz, where he's almost just kind of like a car that doesn't start because no one's come out that far, you know? You know what we're kind of doing here? We're kind of doing an origin story for the world of cars as you see it in the first Cars movie, right? It's like, how do we oh, that's go- that's interesting. How do we go from a world that's been abandoned by humans where all the cars just go about their business doing whatever they do because it's their programming, for lack of a better way to put it, to a world where they have more agency and they have more human personalities? Mm -hmm. Oh, dude. And, and by the way, by the way, this arc is going to be dope because check it out. Once you have decided that you control yourself and you're going to do whatever you want, somebody's still going to take the trash out, homie. Somebody's still going to pave the roads because that's part of agency, too. Mm -hmm. It isn't that, oh, just doing your own thing and twiddling your, your thumbs as some artist is the best thing you can ascribe to ever. It is a purpose. A, pur a purpose is what's the best thing to ascribe to. And you know, you know where I think that becomes actualized in the story is the Mater character. If he if he starts the way Billy's talking about, where he's just waiting on the side of the road for something to happen and he encounters the hero and he, he gets that sense of agency, suddenly like in the new society of the cars, he could be making money by basically acting as like an ambulance, but he has to choose to like service the other people rather than just like waiting mm -hmm. for something to happen. Yeah, yeah I had a vision so of him as a medic. That, that's exactly what I was thinking, a medic. Yeah, that's interesting. Is Okay, so we've got this car on a journey to wherever the road ends. And he's picking up sort of different vehicles along the way because he's sort of questioning what their purpose is wherever they are doing their, you know, clockwork thing. Is there, for lack of a better way to put it, is there like the roving band of, it, it, do they encounter some sort of a villain out on the road? You like know, the guy. Oh, oh, you're saying like wild cars or something? Wild cars or like what's the crack like mirror Mad version of what they're doing, right? Where like it's Mad like Max cast style? Our roles. Yeah, Mad Max style, totally. Oh, dude, you know what I think it is? It's wild motorcycles. I was just about to say motorcycles. It's <laughs> motorcycles. The crotch rocket gang yeah. is oh, always totally. trying to stop them. Yeah. Or the Harley gang, that they're, yeah. they, they're just so loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no, nah, while you're bullshit. That's great because you can hear them thundering through the like you're going through the Grand Canyon area and stuff. You can hear them thundering from miles and miles like a herd. They're like a big herd of like buffalo bison type stuff. And they have that strength in numbers because they're a smaller vehicle and stuff that could be ominous in its own Pixar way. Yeah, man. I mean, we could really keep spinning this because now I'm thinking like there are crop duster planes that just take off, dust the crops, refuel in the same patterns every day. But then it's like, why are you dusting the crops? Because there's no humans there, right? So it becomes like, what else can these planes do to help our heroes or to, to find a new place in society? And they become like the eagles in Lord of the Rings. It's like, <laughs> get, get the planes to help us. <laughs> totally. That's awesome. It's an interesting I mean, there, isn't there a plane spinoff in the in the... In the cartoons, didn't they do like direct to video planes with Dane Cook as a plane plane cook? Are you serious? <laughs> oh yeah, yep. they did. I think, that was <laughs> I think they released that theatrically. Oh, I, I think they oh, did. Guys, it didn't do well. No, no, in. let us have oh, one. Let us in. have one. Oh, Send the voicemail. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer. Yeah, gentlemen, hello. Hi. It's it's finally happened. We got the call from Disney. They said, John, give us that PETA's magic. Bring that PETA's magic into the House of Mouse. And I'm here to say, I'm going to sprinkle it all over your face. <laughs> so let me crack my knuckles, gentlemen, because things are about to get weird. First of all, I need a character in here inspired by my good, dearly departed friend, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper was one of the greatest living legends in the history of cinema, and I want him memorialized forever as a vehicle. Number two, I want a live action role for my other good friend, David Hasselhoff. We know he can act wonderfully alongside a car. I want to see it happen again. The people want to see it happen again. Number three, 
There's three, Brad. <laughs> We're doing three? <laughs> Number three, I need a roll for my boat, the Pam. The Pamela, my yacht, parked off the coast of Malibu. I love it. I also want to see it forever memorialized as a heroic character in our version of the movie Cars. So give me a Dennis Hopper vehicle. Let me see David Hasselhoff acting alongside a car as he was always meant to do. And let me see a giant yacht named the Pamela. Gentlemen, thank you. I'm getting kind of emotional thinking about all these highly personal story beats. I'm going to go have a schwitz. Goodbye. <laughs> all right. Um, I think this was one of the easier Peterses ever, frankly. <laughs> Honestly, because check it out. Okay. One, Dennis Hopper. You make him the head chopper. The head. Absolutely. Uh, he's he's, right he's right. the easy writer. Yeah, that's a, that's a slam dunk uh, Two Hasselhoff co uh, connected with a car. Hasselhoff gets a nice scene in here when one of the basically my dad had a Ford Econoline van. OK, it came out in 1989. It had a VCR in it. A lot of times I would put tapes in that thing and they would stay in there for years. I could have had a Knight Rider tape in that thing. And if some Ford Econoline van that got parked way off somewhere, never had any chance to talk to any other cars, they happen upon him. He becomes part of the group and they go, you want to you want to see something I got from the old world? And he opens up his back doors and everybody looks in there and the TV comes on. And it's a classic scene of Knight Rider. And it's like, what is that thing? I That's think it's brilliant. a maker. I, I really like that. Yeah, yeah I think I, it's a maker. I was thinking too. Let me yes and you. So. If we if we structure this movie almost like Mad Max Fury Road, where this journey to the end of the road has some sort of mythical destination for them, which ends up being the space pad, right? Like this is mm -hmm. where we can go to some other land and find new purpose or whatever. But it's the desolate, empty space pad. And so now their dreams are crushed. The David Hasselhoff Knight Rider tape could be the thing that inspires them to go back to where they came from and change it for the better. And I don't know exactly how, but I'm just trying to think of like, that's, that's like the moment where that tape matters in the story. hundred percent. It feels mm -hmm. very Pixar y in, in that, in that moment. Yeah. It's, it's some inspiring speech that Hasselhoff would give about, you know, like talking to Kit where it's just like, even though you're a car, you're the, you know, you have helped me out more than, you know, your purpose is, you know, something's on the nose, but whatever, you whatever you yeah. want to be. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Out of out, any, honestly, a, a well-chosen out of context as hell uh, night rider scene that they just take as this holy writ could be one of the funniest jokes of all time. And, oh, but and also a heartfelt moment if you play yeah. it right. Oh, of course, but both of them, which is Pixar's milieu, really. And lastly, I think the Pamela is a boat. I think one of the great things about that book, The Road, and not necessarily the movie, because I don't think you can movieize Cormac McCarthy, really, besides, you know, no country. But the bottom line is they were walking towards the ocean. And these cars don't know what the ocean is. But when you get to the ocean, a nice, big, fat, boobed yacht could be out there amongst <laughs> other things you know uh, uh the, the statue of liberty's hand coming out the sand or whatever bill wants but <laughs> but the bottom line is <laughs> the boat could be out there as a symbol of these guys have never seen water like this before you know and it could be near cape canaveral which is at the end of the country you know you go to the end of the country and you see the cape and the, so you know it, it, we could work it out but yeah that's just my pitch for that yeah it's so weird it's almost like Again, I don't know if the main character should be Lightning McQueen, but for the sake of argument, we say it is. If Lightning McQueen in his sort of everyday life in, call it New Mexico, right? So they're middle of the desert, whatever, gets wind of the fact that there are cars that could travel into space, right? And and I want to take the, end, the road till it ends, mm. get to the place where the cars can drive into space. And it's this mythical thing. It's the, it's the, the Greenlands and Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. And he picks these other cars up along the way and they're busting out of the role society has given them and they get to the end of the road and the dark night of the soul moment is that the spaceport is completely abandoned. There's no cars to space. And then looking out on the ocean, we see, you know, in, in their melancholy, the Pamela drives by and is like, guys, hi, so nice to see you. And the Pamela brings word of like, I've been all over the ocean. There are so many things to see and great people to meet. Or yeah. Great 
vehicles to meet. And <laughs> she could almost give them like the directions how to get back home. And it's like they return to their home with this great knowledge to change things for the better. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then we just need to depose whoever this racing warlord is. We're in Albuquerque where they started. It's so yeah, funny. We did, we and that's did the them. final act. When they get back yeah. there, they yeah. have to, to, to. Yeah. And, and instead of deposing him and like beating him, they actually show him how much joy you can have doing something else. You can still do the races, but we also have this option to do these other things. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you don't have to oppress people into doing this because, like I said, somebody's gonna take out the trash. It's gonna get done somehow. That, yeah. That's what that's oh, that's what my wife says anyway. Um, so like so, so, you know, some of these things you don't have to think that your whole society's gonna end just because people get dreams. You know, yeah. I think that's kind of a big deal. That's huge. Awesome. Oh, I think that's wow. So this weirdly came together nicely and in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just get a public apology from the three of you for <laughs> pushing cars, please? Hey, I never said it would be bad. I thought it would be fun. I said I it will, would be uh, horrible and I own it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same place. Billy, I'll apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for uh, reacting so strongly against this idea. The thing that keyed the thing that keyed me in was the idea of like, OK, this is sort of the origin story of the world of cars. Yeah. So it's almost like the cars that we know from Pixar can take place in some in indeterminate future based on what happens in this movie. So is this like the antagonist or the protagonist is like Thunder McKing and then and the, <laughs> <laughs> it's his son, Lightning McQueen in the other movies? Oh my God. You know what? Wait a minute. You know what? You could make this a whole thing where like, their naming conventions are very robotic. And then part of the self-actualization is they take on more human sounding names. Ooh. And the main character can name himself something McQueen at the end. And you realize it's like, yes, a, a, an ancestor of Lightning McQueen. I don't, it doesn't, we don't have to do that. But the idea of taking on names that reflect your personality seems cool. That's yeah, awesome. Like, that, like, like their names start off as like, you know, like Chevy Ford S267. Totally. And yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I like that. And I, I also like, I, I don't know, man, I would, I would like him to be a Thunderbird. And then later we get these different kind of weird cars. Cause it's so funny how like we're good since we're doing it. That's another thing who, okay. Instead of casting actors, let's cast what the cars look like because <laughs> it, by the way, to, yeah. to yes. And you Ron, the, the names should be their vanity plates. And some of them are just things, but someone is also like, you know, something re that's where you get a joke out of it, you know, like <laughs> X, Y, seven, four, two. And then the other one is like, you know, cutie, butt or something, whatever it is, you know, <laughs> I love awesome. it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah, okay, ju cool. juicy, juicy 007. What you got to say? <laughs> By the way, that could also be the function of Pamela. They find the boat and the boat has like a human a name, name painted on the back of it. And suddenly they're like, oh, we can also have just choose names. That's interesting. That's awesome. All right. Nice so work. we, we want to cast our cars or we want to cast <laughs> at least our main character car. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm hmm. sort of feeling like. You almost want this car to be like a like a 1996 Ford Taurus or like a Toyota Corolla. You know what I mean? Like, what's the least assuming car? The only thing is that's not cool for kids or merchandising. So I was going to say, is. too, like, are is this in the future where maybe it wouldn't be such an old car so that it can have these like technological abilities? I think you make it, I think you make it a modern pony car, like a Dodge Challenger or a Charger or something like that, so that it's got get up and go, but it also has four doors for your dumb fat family, too. It's not like uh, it's not a Countach. It's a fast, good car. Also, I'm pitching this hard because I like Dodge Challengers and Chargers because it's up somehow in my blood. But I also think if you think about it, those cars are great on a flat surface. They're great in the desert. They're great on the salt plains. But when they get up into the mountains, they're going to need some help with that snow when they get over here. They're going to need some help with, you know, all this different stuff. They're not all terrain vehicles at all. And that's where the community aspect comes in. So that's why it pitches so hard for them to be a sporty car, not necessarily a sports car. 
Well, I, I, I'm going to pitch this in a corporate way, guys. Uh, whoever wants to give us the most money. Hello. <laughs> Peters has taught you well. Advertising dollar. <laughs> I think there's value in, you know, Ed, you mentioned before, like an Econo line van. Again, it's not sexy, but there's something funny in the brave little toaster setup, like make it just a utilitarian vehicle that discovers it too is worthwhile in a world where like the racing cars are treated as gods. That's interesting. That's interesting. Well, like I said, we need sex. Peterson's going to call again and tell you that we need to make it sexier. So I'm just saving us. I'm hey, I'm sure the they sold a lot of Mater toys in 2007, and that's not a sexy car. I think it's that's okay. Out. I think it's but okay if your hero car. Vehicle. Exactly. I think as yeah. long as your hero car has some sort of, you know, is somewhat toyetic, then your supporting characters can be a little bit more generic. Yeah. yeah. So, How you know, gonna, somewhat sporty. He also then, is a racer. You know, he's still a racer, uh, and that's why he's breaking free. So that's why I actually don't have a problem calling it Lightning McQueen or it becoming what eventually is Lightning McQueen because yeah, Chevy cars also don't age. Really. Mm-hmm. Kind of, but not really. Kind of, not really. <laughs> so are we saying that there's going to be no sort of eye or mouth animation on these realistic looking cars. And if so, kind of, I, I, I like the argument that he made earlier for a Knight Rider type thing, or like literally it's a line that maybe goes or something along those lines. Something it's it's tough because lines. I feel like the mouth thing is it's too weird. And then it almost steps on our premise of like, oh, this could actually happen. On the other side, we do have to account for there's a lot of emotionality that's going to be lost if we don't have some sort of way for these cars to emote. I don't have an answer, but I I don't know if mouths and eyes and the headlights are the right call. I, you know, I would almost I would almost defer to the to Transformers or in a weird way. Like, can you animate just the segments of the car to move and talk and emote in a way that's convincing so that you don't have to like slap a mouth on the bumper but is there a Mm. way where like the headlights Mm. can detach and move this way or that way all of which always stays looking mechanical like it never looks organic but there's there's a way to convey there's movement personality yeah, there's movement in it that conveys personality. I think that's one of those things where you're going to be like, you're going to go to your CG team and be like, look, you need to make it look like this car has a personality. Try 17 different things and let's see what works the best. And th- right. that's when you getting a good tech team is super important. Well, also, and I, I would also pitch him on certain things like we're using realistic looking cars, but when they take off over a rise, give them that little bit of bend to them that Bill Watterson puts into cars when they jump or anybody that draws a car doing anything, they bend the frame a little bit. They rubberize it just that little bit. I would authorize them to do little bits of that sort of animation where it's almost like your eye can't see it, but you feel that this isn't a rigid thing. You know what I mean? And also it's down to the voice actors, man. If the voice actors, if a voice is coming out of a van and it just sounds really good and it's a great voice performance, turning on their headlights could be a moment that makes you cry, you know, if the voice acting is good. So I think we just concentrate on that. Yeah, that's probably cool. true. Do So do we want to get into some voice casting? Do we want to do the thing where it's uh, let's pick our stars to just get in the booth and spend a day doing this movie? Yeah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> day? That's so awesome, too. <laughs> um, all right. So we're talking about Lightning McQueen, for lack of a better way to for lack of a better way to put it, we're talking about uh, a Dennis Hopper sound alike for the head of the motorcycle gang. Or can um, we just take archival clips of, of Dennis Hopper and kind of break and bite from different movies? Do like a Leia in uh, Rise of Skywalker, just sort of I mean, build around yep. what would exist? <laughs> yep, 100%. You or you could get Frank Caliendo. I believe he can do pretty much everything. No, single. never, never get Frank Caliendo ever. Never. <laughs> that is yeah. never a viable option. <laughs> All right. I mean, he's got, he's perfect, but yeah, it's okay. He's so far from perfect. I can't he's, even think of the word. He's not funny, but he is great. 
at great voices. at voices. Ron, you've chosen some weird hills to die on in season three, <laughs> but this is the one I will meet you up top and duke it out. Just just a, pr- a pretty bad John Madden impression fighting a pretty bad I don't know, Caliendo impression, and then just like like Superman uh, three or four when he's fighting himself. I don't know, man. That's funny. Um, All right, I do have one pick that I think is very important. This guy's one of my best friends in the world. He's uh, 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 brilliant. He's funny, uh, and his voice is just like like perfect to play a van that has attitude, and it is Ed Greer. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. Hey, listen. Oh. I'm Ed actually Gre- serious. Ed Greer as the as the pl- as the the snowplow that joins uh, Lightning McQueen on his on his quest to the NASA facility. I'm down dude, with. Dude, I yeah. have to be convinced to clear the road. It's my literal job. It's in my <laughs> programming, and I say, you know what? I don't like the looks of you boys, and I don't like all of this that you this caravan of losers coming through my my territory. I don't think I'll move the stuff. And yeah. I, I, I would buy myself okay. in that. Look, I know we've never cast ourselves in anything before, but I'm doing that. I'm doing it this time. Hey, listen, if there's a movie to do it for, it's this one. I mean, I'll <laughs> I'll play the evil head of the racing. I can do that all day. Oh, hell, you would be incredible at that. That's awesome. Dude. Oh, and also, I was just thinking, though, realistically, if we were thinking about the person that let's talk about that. If it's not Bill, we put Bill in the room. Okay. with a sharpened stake versus somebody we do need somebody that's going to have a seductive uh business like quality because he has convinced these people that their purpose is to serve him and his purpose he's he's denied a whole society their own thing so we would a, a slinky but powerful voice is what Mel gibson <laughs> I was going to say Donald Trump, but you know, um, <laughs> that's going to be huge. You guys just read around in circles. No one gets to do anything they want to do. <laughs> um, um, oh, who played Agent Smith again? Hugo Weaving. Hugo Weaving. Not bad. It's a little, I, if, it's a little if we, if we on still, point, little on I was going to say, if, if we had the sheriff character still in the story, I would say Hugo Weaving would be like more of that in my mind. I oh, yeah. saw this character as like, maybe, maybe the, it's in like an exotic type car. And it's, you know, that's where we get a little bit of flair in there. And you can either go really sophisticated, like, like a Paul Bettany, or you can get, you know, a little Antonio bit more. Banderas. Sure. I don't know. I see that as more sophisticated than I do like used car salesy. Vincent Cassell. Make it like a Formula One. Oh, totally. Totally. French, the night, French the French night Fox. Rating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I can, I could see that. And of course it plays to Hollywood xenophobia. The villain is, is some foreign car, but also the fact that the, those cars, the, uh, it's a fact, it's been a fact for as long as history has been, that the Europeans make great racing vehicles. So naturally, one of those would be obsessed with that. I think it's the highest pinnacle. And, and if they got enough power to build society around that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I don't know where uh, she will fit in, but I want Rosie Perez to be one of the cars. Okay. okay. You're stupid. I, I no, love her <laughs> voice so freaking much. It's yeah, the best I, voice. I do too. I do she should too. be. A, I she mean, should be a female motorcycle in the. Motorcycle. I was just about to say yes. she should be a motorcycle for sure. Yeah, she and could be like she, the 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 Whoopi Goldberg hyena of the uh, of the of the motorcycles from from Lion King. Do, and she could even you? end up rolling with the homies. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe the motorcycles uh, don't suit her anymore because the motorcycles, in their own way, they feel like they're off in the pr- plains having all this freedom, but all they do is roll around the plains all the time. So they're just in the same trap. They just can't see it because they have so much territory. I want to bring this all the way full circle. So we've now got Rosie Perez as the scarecrow, basically. We've got the snow plow as the tin or yeah, the snow plow as the tin man. Who's the cowardly lion? And we will have our full cast. I mean, that's the thing. (laughs) Oh, the one that almost has to diesel. (laughs) <laughs> the one that like we need a character first Ron. that oh, comes no. on the that comes on the trip reluctantly or accidentally 
that yeah, just doesn't, like doesn't really like doesn't really want to be there because thinks it's all super ill advised and like is not really willing to play along. Oh, but I mean, I, I think that's describing. where you get like Michael Sarah as like uh, maybe that's where you get your Prius or something well, in there. Or the, how about the or main the, character the doesn't play. really want to do it by themselves and they just basically yell at the weak guy to come with him and kind of make him come. And then eventually it becomes his decision and he's uh, he gains the courage to to go on this journey. I don't know. No, I, th- I think I, I liked what was in the crosstalk. I think Bill said something. Some, one of you guys said something about the biplane. Uh, yeah, I think a grounded plane. There's nothing more sad. <laughs> That's so sad than a grounded plane. Well, and think about it too. If he's sitting on some on some middle of the prairie landing strip, afraid to take off because he hasn't had the proper maintenance, but all he knows how to do is fly and dust the crops, and he can't do it because he's too scared. That's your cowardly lion character. Boom. Awesome. Yeah. And 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 light and lightning or thunderbird McQuack or whatever the hell uh, it is is going around inspiring people in a way that is it's so funny that this is dumber thunderbird and, McQuack I think you just invented a new Darkwing Duck character totally by the way totally yeah that's he's, amazing he's the, dude he's the black exploitation character he's a black duck who loves to anyway uh so he he's uh so all i'm saying is he this guy is doing what forrest gump did in that movie that uh should never have beaten pulp fiction which is he gets his own quest he gets his own thing in his head and it becomes something to the different people that follow him and he goes through through it and he teaches them and they teach him and and he and he yeah i guess these apostles almost i don't want to get uh, go there but you know, he gets these apostles almost that go to that come to his cause and he gets them from disparate places he got a damn motorcycle a plane a uh, snow plow or this or that and it's it that's so cool actually and, dude. and you know who that's played by tom holland i got you i got you guys i mean oh, he is in the disney family it's, uh, yeah. it's one of the more realistic uses of the Tom Holland card. Oh, he's yes. going to be in the room. <laughs> he's going to be in the room. <laughs> but uh, I'd like so but would he pick somebody? I think Timothy Oliphant is a good main character voice to be because he could be as charming as he wants to be. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? He could be as charming as he wants to be. He could do different accents, different hints of Southern uh, Midwestern things of that nature. He could do anything in that whole milieu wait did we cast the plane yet the the biplane Only in so far as i think you said michael sarah michael I, I take it i take it back i think you get i think you get someone who's uh traditionally very like masculine and very like like a dave batista and then i think the um, comedy comes from the fact that they can't or are too afraid to actually do something you mean like a, a jared padalecki right that's a, yes I, um, I got you i didn't say <laughs> that's Jensen exactly Nichols. what i meant yes. what if it was uh just to, just to have that country twang. What if we got Stone Cold Steve Austin? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. The only problem, problem is if we're going to be somewhat realistic, which we've been in the past, I think Rock. he may have beat a wife at some point. So yeah. I don't know if Disney's uh, going to hire Stone Cold and, Steve Austin. And if you're going to get so get him, you might as well just get The Rock instead. If he, it, it, it's just better. Their voices have are no, so they're qualitatively nothing, They're different. nothing alike, uh, but one's better. And that's period. Well, but the, okay, okay. Let's stop I think wrestling you smell over. What I'm let's stop wrestling over which wrestler gets to be the main character in a in a three hundred million dollar. Not movie. not a main character. I was saying the biplane. I yeah, think you get. And, I think you get yeah. a tough guy. It doesn't have to be that. It could also be like I don't know. Not Stallone. Who's a who's a who's like a who's an action star? Like Keanu Reeves. Had, I don't Wesley know. Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. I think, I think you need a country guy because he's a, he's a crop duster plane. So it's like you need somebody who's got a little twang in their voice. Oh, you know who's a country guy? No. Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not. He's not. It's all he's a sham. Right. It's all a yeah. sham. Um, yeah, you get Ron White just drunk doing a biplane. It's tough I'm because joking. I feel like every actor that comes to Hollywood is asked to shed their accent. So I don't know. I who mean, has Matthew like really McConaughey is that ridiculous? <sighs> I just don't feel like it's the right I, vibe. I, I, I just don't want to take off, man. Yeah, but I when I hear that, I think it's because I'm stoned, not because I'm scared. You know, 
like yeah. there there are connotations to to getting celebrities as voices is that a little bit of their actual personality is tied to whatever their character is whether it's conscious or not hmm, let's think that's why I was well, thinking well, it's some sort of a tough guy because then, you know, you you hear I, this big grumbly voice is like, oh well, I can't I, I can't do that. You know, I like actually the, am going with Wesley Snipes. I actually think he would be great. I mean, he was a drop zone. <laughs> I don't. I don't he has he has experience with airplanes. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. Thank you for the spin because I had nothing. <laughs> Well, I mean, we've got, so we've got as the other characters on the quest, we've got Timothy Oliphant as our Lightning McQueen-esque character. We've got Rosie Perez coming out of the motorcycle gang to join the group. We've got Ed Greer playing the snowplow. (laughs) Or, you know, a reasonable alternative. Ed Greer or an Ed Greer type like Idris Elba. Go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about Mark Hamill as the... Yeah, I mean, I I'm always for Mark Hamill voicing something. I think the guy's a great voice performer. So, right, anyway. okay. And who's the uh, who's the uh, the 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 influence the, the 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 race car? What's his name and what's his who's the actor that we picked? Vincent Cassell. Uh, Vincent Cassell. But I don't. Yeah. We didn't we didn't name the car, but it would be like. I don't know. You could almost just call the car whatever it is. Yeah. If it's Benz or if it's like Ferrari, whatever it is, I think you just call it that. Yeah. Yeah. You call him. uh, Yeah. Ferrari. Ferrari. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, (laughs) You know? Yeah. 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 yeah, That's tight. That's tight. Well, because, you know, like tornado (laughs) racing cars don't have license plates anyway. So that it would have to be a different. It would uh, have to be his name. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I get that. Totally. All right. So. That's awesome, dude. And we got Pamela Anderson, guys. Don't forget Pamela that. Pamela Anderson should definitely voice herself as the boat. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, now, is our boss still on speaking terms with his now ex-wife to get the I deal done? The, the, the real question is, is she on speaking terms with him? Because he seems to want to put her in this movie. And I wonder if there's ulterior motives to that. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, you can take a dig at Pamela and actually have it be Jenny McCarthy. <laughs> You know what? I think Peter's going to have to handle that particular casting assignment on his own. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, should we should we pick a director? Are we missing anything in this cast? I think we're good on the cast. I think so, too. Oh, yeah, main right. cast. There's going to be all types of bits with different cars that they meet in different places totally. they go. And there's going to be so many opportunities for multiple different actors. But for our main our main thing, yeah, I think we and we actually managed to cast these cars multiculturally. And that's what I've been trying to do. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I love that. So, yeah, who, who would direct this, guys? And you can't say John Favreau or else you get beat to death. With <laughs> Well, I'm going to say somebody. You related. should. We should have like a swear jar for John Favreau and Taika Waititi. <laughs> like you have to put twenty dollars in the jar. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm go related though, uh, and that's Dave Filoni. That's another one that's becoming way too. That's, it's that's over a swear jar. Swear too. jar. Swear he's jar. Great. Swear jar. I disagree. He'd be perfect for this. He's, but go he's ahead. on literally every episode. We need to, he needs to pay us rent. For, okay. for you know, cool for being in our heads. <laughs> I could use that. <laughs> So, so are you guys aware of the movie rubber? Not at all. No. The protagonist of the movie is a spare tire that <laughs> goes across the landscape of the Southwest killing people. So he's a serial killer spare tire. The movie's called rubber. It's a weird little indie movie. It was directed by a guy named Quentin Depew. Um, I don't know what his story is. I'm going to look him up really quick. Oh, while you're doing that, I will second that because it's psychotic. And it did show that you can humanize anything on screen with a low, what it was obviously a low budget. He humanized that tire. You kind of could see what the tire was feeling as it <laughs> went across the Southwest murdering. So I just think if he would tone that down a bit and see, he, he won't be able to murder anybody in this movie because there are no humans. So his skills for anthropomorphization will be on on hit the whole movie. So this dude actually has directed um, a number of films, but his his main gig is as a DJ under which he, he Love performs it. by the name Mr. Oizo. Love it. Sign him okay. up. Dude. I was going to say Rob <laughs> Cohen from Fast and the Furious, but that's so weird that I just want to support that. 
Uh, but dude, yeah, I think- to get anybody in the Disney family, to get that guy into the Disney family, we got to do it now. That's, that's like Inception right there. You're just you're <laughs> bringing it down from the inside. <laughs> but honestly, if you take a guy with that sort of weird out there sensibility and give him the production team of a Disney live action remake, I think you could end up with something really interesting. I yeah. mean, that's that that's really what it's all about. It's bringing emotion to emotionless things and it's like if you can do that don't worry about the acumen in terms of special effects or anything else it's just can you make a story that has heart for things that don't you know Mm -hmm. that's it nice job guys mr oizo we're calling pick up the phone when john (laughs) peters calls well guys weirdly I never was expecting this not only not only have we created uh something that I find really intriguing, but we have achieved reboot. <laughs> Woo! So we are, we are basically telling the story of how the civilization seen in the movie Cars came to be in the aftermath of some unnamed, un, unexplained human exodus from Earth. Um, we're living in a world defined by sort of the rigid clockwork programming of these intelligent cars. And our main character is one who breaks from that tradition on a quest to find the road into space, which turns out to be an abandoned Cape Canaveral where he finally encounters a magical being in the form of a VHS of David Hasselhoff who convinces him that the magic was in him all along in true Wizard of Oz fashion, and him and his motley crew take their newfound ethos back to the world of racing to revolutionize society into a place where dreams can come true. I mean, come on. (laughs) You guys, this is so great. (laughs) Um, Anything else to add? I mean, I never want you bitch to doubt me again, (laughs) ever, ever. Uh, I don't want to hear, I don't want to see the eight page text of why we can't <laughs> reboot these things. Uh, no, honestly, guys, I think not only was it tough to reboot Cars live action because that just sounds ridiculous, but also, you know, Cars, I- as successful as it was, it's also not really seen as something that has much emotional weight and kind of one of Pixar's lesser story efforts. So I'm happy to kind of like, reform it so that maybe people think differently of the cars franchise just in general maybe this like you said if this is a kind of an unofficial prequel maybe it even adds a little context to those movies and and makes them a slightly richer and i think it does so if you at home like what we're doing here and how can you not after that wild ride hit the subscribe button people you made it all the way to the end we gave you all this good content you know you want to come back the subscribe button will just make sure that we are getting the benefit from what you're going to do anyway which is come back and watch the next episode next week we are here with an extra special halloween episode and until then i am producer bill for billy business for ron swallow for ed greer we will see you next time